and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. I apologize for the delay since my last episode. It's schoolwork and finals and all that fun stuff. It was gotten in the way. This week, though, we're picking back up with taking a look at Nintendo Power number 7 for July and August of 1989. Now, because last time, for the last year of the magazine, I had problems with, well, covering a game fairly early on and it, taking a look at the preview coverage and doing the review then and not being able to talk about it more in depth when we get the full actual review later on, what I'll be doing for this year of Nintendo Power is I'll be putting my focus and emphasis on games that are featured in the magazine. And then maybe later on, after the conclusion of this year of the magazine, once all that's up, I'll take a look at the games which are previewed but didn't actually get featured, or possibly even didn't come out at all, in a sort of in another sort of best of the rest kind of issue or episode. Um, hopefully, this won't be as much of a thing when Nintendo Power makes the switch from bi-monthly to monthly. But as a consequence of this, this issue of Nintendo Power, I'm not actually going to be reviewing any new games. The reason being is most of the games that have been covered this issue are ones which I reviewed in my um, Best of the Rest re uh, three episodes earlier. And the ones that weren't covered there are games that are going to be featured more prominently next issue of Nintendo Power. So, if you skipped the episodes where I went through the games that made the top 30 but weren't featured in the magazine... Go back and rewatch those. Um, once you're done watching this one, of course. So, all that out of the way, let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Mega Man 2, with a neat little figure diorama. We also have an ad encouraging subscribers to get their friends to subscribe to Nintendo Power Magazine. If you do, they get a pin, and you get a poster. I don't know, I'd prefer the pin over the poster... So that doesn't exactly incentivize me, if I were a subscriber at the time, to try and get my buddies to subscribe to the magazine. Although, as an aside, I actually went on eBay and looked to see if they had these pins on there. Indeed, they do. And that's kind of a rarity for a Nintendo Power exclusive merchandise like this. Normally, I don't find this stuff on there at all, unless it's stuff like books. Uh, currently, the pins are only available new and cost about... Oh, 10 to 18 bucks, depending on where you get it from. However, all the au auction listings I saw at the time I checked were buy it now prices. If the pins went up for auction, the range could be v fairly different. If you've seen them for less or more in your area or at a convention, please let me know in the comments. In the letters column, we also have an item for the Creative Gamers file. So this guy from Wyoming, Will Turnbow, built a stand-up arcade cabinet for his Nintendo Entertainment System, with side-mounted cup holders, shelves for cartridges, um, places to put your strategy guides, everything. Going from the photograph, it even looks like the cabinet handles cable management, which is really nice. So, Will, if you're watching this video and you still have the cabinet, and you have access to a video camera, please, please post a video as a response showing the cabinet more in depth, showing how you built it, uh, how you handle Campbell management, just show me everything about how you built the thing. I would love to see how you made this, and heck, if people watch, other people watching this video want to build their own arcade cabinet for their home console, or as some sort of main cabinet, I'm certain that a lot of them would find it incredibly edif edifying, I believe is the correct word, and learn a lot from that. It's something I think people would definitely be interested in. Next up is the second part of the Mega Man guide, which goes more in depth on some of the devices Dr. Light will provide you as you make your way through the game to help you get past obstacles like the jet sled, the levitation platform, and the wall walking platform. In the later games in the series, once Rush is introduced, these will become the Rush power-ups. We also get maps for each of the robot masters up to Quick Man and Flash Man stages, though what we don't get are strategies for beating the robot masters themselves. Presumably they're saving that for a later issue of the magazine or something. We also have a continuation of the Faxanadu guide from earlier, 
continuing up to cleansing the Elven Fountain, which completes the first major quest objectives, though there are ones after that. In Counselor's Corner, we have a question about what it takes to trigger a bean ball, a bean ball brawl in bases loaded. Try saying that five times fast. In the top 30 for this issue, Ninja Guy Den enters the list, and it enters in the top five as well. Also new to the list is WWF WrestleMania, Operation Wolf, and Legacy of the Wizard, which I have previously reviewed, and The Adventures of Lolo, which I haven't. Moving us into the preview coverage, we have an article discussing Dragon Warrior, uh, which, re as we mentioned previously, was released in Japan as Dragon Quest. They changed the name here for the U.S. because they wanted to avoid tr treading on one of the trademarks for TSR, publishers of Dungeons & Dragons. And just to squash any bits about Nintendo being over-cautious about lawsuits and stuff here, um, in 1989, 1988, I believe that's when TSR switched ownership from Gary Gygax to Loretta Williams and um, the Bloom family, I believe it is, being the primary um, shareholders of TSR. And consequently, these fam um, these people were more litigious than Gary was than it was under Gary's leadership. Um, so I don't feel like Nintendo is being overcautious here. Though I do find it somewhat amusing because it, there was a tabletop role-playing game that came out later on in the United States called Dragon Warrior or Dragon Warriors. Which, actually, I think that was out at the same time in the UK. But, anyway, the point is, it existed. So, there's that bit there, too. The article itself goes more in depth on what exactly an RPG is, how you play it, and describing the concept of what you'll be doing a lot of in Dragon Quest, grinding. There's also a rundown of the things you need to do in the game once you want to get started, in terms of you put the game in, Turned it on, named your character, all that wonderful jazz. Um, we get a more in-depth article on Dragon Quest later, though, so I'm going to save the actual full review of the game until then. We get another article on Strider, uh, which discusses some of the special moves in the game, like the triangle jump, as well as maps of the first four stages of the game. We move more heavily into the preview coverage with an article on Robocop, which I've already reviewed, in the Best of the Rest series. There's also a preview of DuckTales, which is the cover game for next issue, so I should really cover it then. The article discusses the semi-nonlinear nature of the game, as well as some of the characters who will help Scrooge McDuck along the way. There's also a four-page article about Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which spends a lot of time discussing basic gameplay, but without any real strategy elements. As this is kind of a, I wouldn't say a non-linear, adventure game, but because this is kind of a ex an adventure game with exploration elements, knowing what you need to do and where you need to go at the start is kind of important. Next up is Wizards and Warriors 2, which is a lot like Wizards and Warriors 1, by all appearances, except this game has less princess rescuing and more focus on going through elemental-themed levels. In this issue's installment of Howard and Nestor, we have Nestor helping out the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with their first game. This strip is somewhat notable in that there is absolutely no appearance of Howard in this installment. Also, the joke in the strip involves confusing scrolls and pizzas, which is somewhat odd considering that the words and the in-game items for the scrolls and the pizzas and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles look nothing alike. All in all, this is the first real dud in the comic thus far. Hopefully, it'll be the only dud thus far in the comic. In our classified information column this issue, we have Konami's first variant on the Konami code for the game Gyrus. If the player enters right, left, right, left, down, down, up, up, start, which is basically the Konami code in reverse, the player gets 30 lives. Nice little twist there. Go messing with players' ex <clears throat> players' expectations. In the video shorts column, we have an article about bad dudes, which, once again, I've already reviewed. We have mention of Guerrilla War, which also appears to omit any mention of the fact that in the game, you are playing as Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. 
in our pack watch column, well, things get really interesting. How interesting? Well, take a good long we get take a good long look at the Game Boy. If Gunpei Yokoi wasn't remembered for anything else, having designed the Game Boy is certainly a hell of a thing to be remembered for. The Game Boy is affordable with a decent battery life and durable to a degree that Timex basically threw up their hands and said, "Forget it, we can't top this for durability." Like there's a um Game Boy somewhere. We'll probably see it in the letters column at some point in the future, which was set on fire and still played just fine afterwards. That's that's awesome. In addition to discussion of a few upcoming titles, we get a rundown of third-party controllers and peripherals for the NES, including the NES satellite, which on the um, on the upside provides a four-player multi-tap. On the minus side, it does it wirelessly through infrared, which doesn't work very well. In fact, I'd say infrared never really hit prime time until, well, Bluetooth. So, there's that. Um, also, a particular note here with the third-party controllers, though, is Hudson bringing their joy card out to the United States. This is their own sort of take on the Famicom slash NES controller with TurboFire. That's a controller I'd like to check out at some point. Unfortunately, from a check on eBay, if you want to get a joy card, it's going to cost you about 10 to 15 bucks. Moving on, in honor of Nintendo Power's first anniversary, the magazine is doing a rundown of a whole bunch of hidden one-ups in various NES games. In the NES Journal column, well, not only is this the first anniversary of Nintendo Power magazine, it's also the centennial of the Nintendo Corporation. The magazine gives a brief rundown of Nintendo's history as a company before moving on to another announcement, the launch of the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. I'll say that I've never actually watched the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, and I'm considering watching a few episodes on Netflix just to get a feel for it. And finally, for our celebrity profile, in this issue, we get a profile of Michael Dorn, who plays Lieutenant Warp on Star Trek The Next Generation, and would go on to play the character through three, four movies, and Deep Space Nine. For some reason, the article is captioned, though, they say that Worf's character's name is C.J. Worf. Considering when the character was introduced, he had the, held the rank of Lieutenant Junior Grade, or Lieutenant J.G., I suspect this was a slip-up on the part of the writers for Nintendo Power. As far as for what Dorn's been up to now, currently he has a recurring role on Castle as Dr. Carter Burke, and he was in a fan-made web series based on Castlevania, titled Castlevania Hymn of Blood. So, as I stated at the top of the show, everything that I would have normally reviewed this issue um, has previously been reviewed. So, yeah, there's that. I'm still going to get my pick, though. All of the games featured this issue were all single-player games, so just one pick, and that one's going to be Mega Man 2, though Strider comes in a close second. Next issue... DuckTales is the cover game, um, and from the next up thing at the end of the issue, it looks like we'll be getting a more in-depth look at um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and possibly also Wizards and Warriors. So I'll be going more in-depth on those there. So you can look forward to that next time, which is when I will be seeing you.